Okay, so I just got notification that this is now streaming live on Facebook. So uh, hello again to uh, everyone and welcome welcome to Reading While Black, a panel discussion hosted by Food Share Toronto. My name is Philip Dwight Morgan. I am a freelance writer uh, here in, based in Toronto, Takaranto, and um, I am beyond thrilled to have these five panelists with me here today. Um, I was telling them earlier that my, my mother called me and uh, made it very clear that she is more excited about these panelists than she is to see me on this panel. Um, these are just incredible, brilliant, wonderful people that uh, I'm so excited to have the chance to speak with tonight. Um, so let me just introduce them to you, first of all. First, we have Suzanne Barr, Toronto chef, activist, and food share board member. Next, we have Selena Caesar Chavan, consultant and former member of parliament. Then we have Shamarke Dugo, city councillor for the city of Victoria. Next, we have Tyrone Edwards, journalist and host on E! News Updates. And last but not least, we have Debbie King, health and fitness leader, athlete, and community organizer. So firstly, I want to acknowledge that the sacred land in which we operate is situa situated upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. Food Share recognizes the many nations of Indigenous people who presently live on this land, those who have spent time here, and the ancestors who have hunted and gathered on this land known as Turtle Island. Although we are pleased to be sharing space with all of you today for this discussion of Leading While Black, it is important to frame this discussion in light of its connection with the struggle for reconciliation and Indigenous sovereignty, as these are not separate struggles, but are part of the same larger fight against white supremacy. I invite you to take a moment to consider what this acknowledgement means to you and to think about the ways in which you can support the process of reconciliation and Black liberation. Thank you. My name is Philip Dwight Morgan. As I mentioned before, I'm a Toronto-based journalist, writer, and activist, and I'm going to be moderating this wonderful uh, conversation this evening. I first met uh, Paul Taylor, the executive director of FoodShare, about, I think, maybe two and a half, three years ago through a mutual friend, and the connection was instantaneous. Um, Paul is just an incredible person doing incredible work, and he has surrounded himself with staff that are just um, just absolutely amazing. You know, from the good food boxes to the student workshops to the community kitchens, the, uh, the work that FoodShare does is just absolutely incredible. And so I'm sure many of you um, on this, uh, attending this panel already know about FoodShare, but uh, please spread the word. And for those of you who don't know, please just check it out. It's an incredible organization. FoodShare recognizes that as an organization, it must acknowledge and actively work to dismantle systemic forms of oppression that exist throughout the food system and beyond. Food Share also recognizes that the voices, talents, and successes of Black leaders are not celebrated as often or as loudly as they deserve, especially when those leaders are working in traditionally white-led spaces. That is why Food Share is pleased to be able to bring together a group of incredible, incredible Black leaders for tonight's panel. When sharing or posting about this panel on social media, please use the hashtags, hashtag leading while Black and hashtag Black Leadership Matters. As you can see, we also have two interpreters from the Toronto Sign Language Interpreter Service who will be providing ASL interpretation for tonight's panel. All right, so Without further ado, we're going to dive into uh, to tonight's panel and provide an opportunity for our panelists to introduce themselves. So, Suzanne, could you can you go first? How would you feel about going first? 
I love the idea of going first. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Um, again, thank you, Vujer, um, and everyone that's uh, joining in on this on this extraordinary um, memory. Like, really, truly, please take note of this this moment in time and this conversation and how important it is for all of us to be here. Um, I'm a chef. I'm an activist. I'm an activ um, activator. I am everything that my great grandmother and my mother and my father uh, had filled me up with in, in loving and learning and understanding about how important it is to um, see my dreams and fulfill them and pursue them as much as I can. Um, I currently reside in Toronto and and I'm currently excited about you know the temperature of where things are right now globally and the the amount of of importance that it is that we have these talks that we share our messages that we share our stories because so many people are listening so many people are taking into to real um personal uh, approaches on how they want to maneuver through these waters and what are their next steps and and i'm truly honored to be here today and thank you Thank you so much, Suzanne. Next, uh, Selena, could you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone on Facebook and beyond uh, in the internet world. I'm Selena Caesar Schwann. It's, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I wanna thank uh, Foodshare, all the volunteers and everyone who had a hand in putting together this platform. The ASL interpreters, I think it's dope that we have uh, ASL interpreters. This is one of the first one panels that I've had that. Had that. I think it's critically important that we're as inclusive as possible, especially in this time as we as a black as black communities are um, actively talking to other communities about some of our struggles. It's important that everybody feels included. Um, I do want to acknowledge as well that uh, we are all sitting in our respective areas from across Turtle Island. And one of the things that our indigenous brothers and sisters and persons have given to us in Canada in particular is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And in order for us to get to a point of reconciliation, we need to talk about the truth. And how you interpret the truth, not my problem. The truth is the truth. And I'm so happy to be a part of this panel that will allow us to further tell our stories, the truth about ourselves and uh, an opportunity to share. So I look forward to the discussion and being a part of it. Thank you. Hey, um, Shamarke, uh, why don't you introduce yourself next? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Shamarke Dubo, uh, located at uh, the unceded uh, Coast Salish Territory of the Lekwungen and Lusanix Nation, known as City of Victoria in BC. Um, I'm grateful to really be part of this discussion and to be able to see my brothers and sisters. Um, I'm an African diaspora, uh, someone who came to Canada from the continent due to the colonial and forced displacement and, and the conflict is because of the impact of historical uh, colonial history out there. So for me, just joining and coming to this land of uh, indigenous land, but also uh, joining the people of African descent and origin who has had history of decades and centuries of organizing and, and being able to build this country. And especially in Victoria and BC has a long history of uh, black communities which has have added and built this province. So it's such a privilege for me to be talking from you from a province that has a long history of uh, black people. So thank you for having me. Debbie, I'm gonna ask you to go next, please. All right, good evening, everybody. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Debbie King. If you follow me online, you may also know me as Superfit Mama. Uh, I am born and raised here in Toronto. 
I uh, identify in many ways. I identify as an athlete. I am a master's track and field athlete, which means I am not a professional, but I am completely committed and uh, compete on a global level uh, in track and field. I also am a leader within the health and fitness industry here in Toronto. And uh, most recently, I've started identifying myself as a community organizer as well. And that stems from my role as one of the co-founders of the Queen Victoria Black Student Success Committee. Uh, and that is a parent-led organization uh, affiliated with my daughter's school here in Toronto. Thanks so much, Debbie. Tyrone, can you please introduce yourself? You're muted, Tyrone. Unmute, unmute. That's, that's a perfect place for me to start. Um, a, a few weeks back, I made an appearance. I'm a TV uh, host. I, I'm, I'm a reporter on eTalk. And uh, I, I decided on air uh, to unmute myself. Um, and, and what that is, is, uh, you know, the, the watering down of your true feelings. It's the hiding behind a wall that we've, a lot of us have built up to protect ourselves, to, uh, to, to sort of shield us from the disrespect and from the mistreatment and uh, uh, the downright disregard for, 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 for our skin color and for our people. Um, but I, I'm happy to be here today because um, from that moment, and uh, there's been so many great conversations and, and that's just, uh, allowed me to, to to have the courage and um, and 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 have that that urge to learn and to to see what other people have been going through and and figure out how we can just sort of band together and um, and get to a place where, where where we can be proud of our uh, contribution to to righting a lot of these wrongs that we've just lived with. So my my mantra has always been one love. I'm a Jamaican Canadian, uh, so. Uh, with that, glad to meet anyone that I'm meeting for the first time. And uh, thanks for having me. One love. Thanks so much for that. Okay, I'm just going to take a deep breath to digest all of that beauty that just was shared with the world. <sighs> okay, so now I'm going to jump into the questions. And my first question is for the entire group. And so I'm just wondering if you can... Um, tell us a bit about yourself and specifically why it's important to discuss Black leadership. Um, Shamarki, why don't we start with you? Uh, th thank you. I am actually now speaking from City of Victoria, the City Hall. And when we speak about Black leadership, to me, it's very crucial. And it's very crucial to see the spaces we operate and the spaces we live and that we will see someone who looks like us, someone who could relate to our experience. So when I decided to run for Victoria City Council and on the island in 2018, I, I looked around and I could not see anyone that looks like me. Uh, and that's why I was so proud to see when Selena was disturbing at the parliament it, it gave me courage uh, so that I could be bold and, and not be afraid and to bring um, uh, my vision, but also ways of doing politics different. So when I looked around, there was the last Victoria City, City Councilor was uh, 153 years ago, the time that I decided to, to run. And to me, uh, that was very, uh, someone who was here uh, eight years was unbelievable because uh, one, I wanted to see who could share the experience with me so that when I nav navigate these spaces and, and to learn the tools to really uh, present my ideas and the conversations from the community at large. How would so I, I think when we have a black leadership, they 
they bring everything that everyone else would bring on the table. Uh, but also on the top of that, they will bring their lived experiences and, and other communities with them to those uh, policy and decision makings. And I've seen that. Uh, I have seen in the last two years that I was on council, uh, communities across uh, Victoria and outside even Victoria, people constantly uh, reach out to me and to hear my thoughts or how would I go about this? Uh, all levels of government, because they see me and they, they, they say, okay, you are in these spaces. What, what would I do and, and, and how could this happen? And within the two years I was, and I, I, I took part in changing the politics in Victoria with other progressives in, on council. And we really brought bold solutions uh, that really is helping uh, not only the black people, uh, but everyone. And that's the, the thing, when you bring policies that really geared for black communities, then it serves everyone, every marginalized groups in, in the community. So I think having black leadership is critical, critical right now. And, and that's why for me, uh, it's humbling to be in this group because someone who have, have been uh, to, to a place that there are not a lot of black people, but historically there has been a lot of black people who've left back to the States after the slavery ended in, uh, at the Southern border. But it's really, to me, seeing your beautiful voices and beautiful faces really is, it helps my well-being. It helps my, who I am but it also reassures that I'm not alone in this fight, that uh, we are continuing the legacy of uh, our, our ancestors and people before us for uh, years and centuries have been organizing uh, for the sake of, to make sure that everyone has access to dignity and quality of life and opportunity. So yes, black leadership is important and more than ever, today. Thanks so much for that. Now, rather than going around the, the screen and trying to pull people, you know, I saw a number of you were nodding along and smiling. So if you feel compelled to sort of riff off of what Shamarke was saying, if you, if you want to go next, go for it. I think with the questions, you should just jump in as you see fit. So I'm going to just jump in then. <laughs> Thank you. I let it pause for a moment, but I'm going to jump in. And I, I love what Shamarke says, because I think when we talk about Black leadership, uh, representation matters. Unfortunately, in our school system, um, there isn't an opportunity for a lot of our young people to read about the great historical uh, figures that are part of our legacy, are part of why I am here, why all of us are on this panel today, irrespective of our role, uh, why we are here. So the representation that we see, whether it's in entertainment or fitness or in um, the world of cooking or in politics, is critically important to not only see us there, but to be vocal while we're there. I always say that if representation matters, if nothing matters to the person that's sitting in the seat, does that representation really represent us? Like mm -hmm. we, we need that representation to really matter in a way that's gonna disturb and disrupt the status quo. It's gonna disturb and disrupt um, what is currently okay for everyone. Things are not okay in our community. And if we're not willing to be disruptors, um, if we're not willing to say, let's challenge a little bit, if we're not willing to rattle the cage and be a little bit loud, then what is the point of representing? And I'll, I'll add one thing to that. And I could say this because I'm no longer in parliament. People might say, well, you're saying this because you're no longer there. Representation doesn't require a title. It doesn't require you to have something over your head in little gold letters that says, so-and-so is so-and-so, or is this thing. 
representation could be what you do in your everyday community to disrupt, to challenge, to break glass ceilings. And it doesn't require a title. It doesn't require you having someone else give you permission to be at some table that they have created that never was intended to you for you to sit at in the first place. So when we think about talking about black leadership, I think we need to talk about it from the context of let's 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 shape this a little bit differently all of these systems that we're talking about that are infiltrated with the systemic racism whether or not people believe it or not we're designed to keep women out we're designed to keep people like us out they weren't there was no intention for us to be there in the first place so when we when we talk about leadership we have to frame it in a way that says, okay, look, it wasn't designed for you to be there. Let's think about how we infiltrate those spaces in a different way and, um, and, and be productive in those spaces in a different way. And understand that even if we're not in that space, we could still be disruptive outside of that space. We could still push boundaries outside of spaces. And we could do that in our own way, talking about black leadership, talking about leadership, forget the black part, just leadership in our community is something that we've been doing since the beginning of time. We are kings and queens, that is our legacy, that is our history. Our history didn't start at slavery. So leadership is something that's in our DNA just as much as our melanin is in our DNA. And I think talking about that is normalizing it only because it's not in the books. The erasure of blackness from our from our education system makes it such that we need to talk about it. At some point, I'm hoping that it's just the norm that we just see and know that leadership in our own context and the way we define it and the way we feel comfortable it, about it is as rampant throughout Canada as any other type of leadership. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so quiet. Yeah, who, who wants to I who wants to yourself. follow who wants to follow that up? Who's Oh, I'll, I'll follow up there. Um, you know, I'm so happy, Selena, that you touched on uh, leadership within different industries. You opened up by talking about a lot of different institutions and a lot of different fields. Uh, and I think that's so important because the disruption that we all know that we need to see needs to happen across so many different playing fields. It's not just politics. It's not just education. It's not just policing. It is literally every space, um, you know, whether it's a workspace, a social space, a lifestyle space, there's so many places where that needs to happen. So we need to be talking about leadership broadly that way. But I think, um, you know, to Schmarke's point about um, the representation and the, the lived experiences and the stories that come out from our black leaders, we are not a monolith as a black people. Um, we have different experiences, but we also have different leadership styles. And I think it's so important to see, um, you know, the different ways these get woven together, whether you are more of an outspoken, um, you know, very vocal kind of disruptor, or if you're more of a systems kind of person, um, you know, whether you're a newcomer, whether you're a second generation Canadian, these all come together in so many different ways. And I think that's the way that we have this broad, rich kind of sampling of examples of leadership that our young people can now see and start to kind of find their place in for the future. I'll, I'll hop in just to uh, just to add to that because I think I'm at a place in my life personally where um, the idea of leadership for me kind of kind of is changing or uh, can take on multiple forms. So there's certain initiatives that I'm a part of that I kind of do quietly. Um, and there are other, uh, other platforms that bring me on national television. Um, those, are, those are two very different approaches, um, but all with the same end goal. And when I'm listening to everybody on this panel speaking today, I'm also seeing different styles of leadership, which is also important because um, with everyone speaking, I'm, I'm just sitting here getting hyped and, uh, and, and it's really, uh, it's really reassuring and it's really encouraging um, because we all know in the last little bit, it's it's been heavy. 
And one of the things that I've been speaking to is everyone just kind of doing their part, you know, um, and not and not not allowing the heaviness that is that is um, our current situation to 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 outdo you uh, or to outweigh your love, your passion, your desire to to replace a lot of what it really comes down to is replacing a lot of these these this hate with love um, and really just trying to um, be be the change in the spaces that you occupy. And, and I think that's the most important part. So it's like challenging old ideologies and introducing new ones. And then also holding yourself accountable to make sure you're up to speed and make sure you're reading and make sure you're listening. So um, if you see me quiet at any point in this time, that's because I'm amongst some greats. And so I got to soak this up as much as, as much as I got to contribute. I'm just going to jump in because like I'm with you Tyrone there's so much <laughs> and what everyone has just said that just like makes me feel like this is exactly where I'm supposed to be in my life right now this is exactly where I should be focusing on this is exactly the conversations that I feel like I've been having throughout the world navigating the world in the hospitality industry an industry that has for so many years marginalized folks that have not seen us that we have been completely overlooked. We have been underpaid. We have been underappreciated. And this right now, what's going on in this in this global world pandemic is has affected us as the most some of the most vulnerable people. And trying to to leverage something coming out of this, trying to envision, reimagine what this industry could look like, what what our roles are, what my role is. I just closed my restaurant that had been operating for nine months. And it was one of the hardest things I've had to do and the most boldest thing I had to do, which was to call out the injustices that I saw that I have seen in the 15 years of my life being a chef working in this country and in the United States. The, histor the history that lives within the kitchens that we as Black people have been cooking for all those and we have been silent. We, they, they've tried to silence us. They've used our food as ways to be able to connect through us, much like our music, but our food tells our story. We hold on to the culture and the richness of our food from the continent, from the Caribbean, from this country and many other countries around the world that we are inspired by because that is our food, that's our story, that's our message. And I, as a chef, and as also as an activist, an activator, have put all that I can and the work that I do and making sure that leadership looks like whatever it needs to look like in the moment and understanding that everyone has a, 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 a voice and whether your voice is silent and whether you're using your voice to help launch someone else's voice that lives in a space where they don't feel that they can announce, they can project, they can talk about their stories because the trauma is real, it's rich. Why, when I decided to become a chef, my father was so scared and so nervous for me because he knew of the history of what it meant to be black in kitchens. And being black in kitchens is still a, a conflict. Of being a BIPOC in a kitchen is still something that we're battling. We're trying for both front in the house and the back of the house. And when I decided to open my first restaurant, I had to make sure that inclusivity was the key to being able to create a bonded, a cohesive structural team and that it's not just one person that leads it it's a collective and that is what i am about and that is the reason why leadership looks like mentorship leadership looks like training leadership looks like all of the things that we have learned in our in our in our in our process of of navigating and 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 distinguishing between things that are so relevant in our life and the historical and the legacy that is also a part of all that we've been doing. Food is what brings people together. We will always need food in our life. And we all always, as Black people, have a place. Wow. I, that's deep. And, and that makes me so grateful for uh, Black women. Uh, as, a, as a Black man, I'm always having so much gratitude and my existence is because of you. And one thing Susan really triggered thought for me is the, the notion when we talk about black leadership, 
And is there a fear for them to perform their whole selves in all the spaces they are in work and everywhere due to unwelcoming organizational cultures and dominant white narrative? I think that is one discussions and conversation I had with a lot of folks who are in a different sectors that sometimes they can be all they can be because of certain uh, structural or organizational culture wouldn't uh, welcome that. So it's, it's interesting that how inclusive and safe space you create in, in uh, and that's why when you have black leadership, then they create safe and inclusive for everyone to be their whole self. Thank, thank you to each of you for your responses and just for um, being so, so open and so honest. And um, I just think it's a tremendous gift. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. I'm gonna jump into some individual, some questions directed at individuals. But I, I just want to say, you know, if any of you, you know, if you if you feel your head nodding, if you feel yourself smiling, feel free to jump in on the question. Even though I'm directing it at a particular person, you're more than welcome to uh, jump in if you have insights. So, uh, Tyrone, I want to pose a question to you. Um, you know, I was just reflecting on what you were saying about the the heaviness of the current moment and uh, replacing love with hate. And, you know, I just. I, I saw the recent interview that you did um, where you said, you know, when I look to my left and I look to my right, I don't really hear the rage that I feel uh, um, that I feel coming from anyone else. And um, I was just wondering, one, were you afraid of sharing your rage? And two, do we need to create more intentional spaces for black rage, um, whether it be in the media, in our workplaces, in our schools? Just throwing that out there for you. Cool. I'm gonna kind of answer this out of order because uh, because I feel compelled to. So, do we need to create these uh, like intentional spaces? Sure. I think we need to create them, but we also need to just demand them. We also need to just be real uh, and and be us. Uh, you know, Shvarki said the, the opportunity to be wholesome, to be our whole selves, and not feel like we need to mute or uh, dilute ourselves or make it uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, whitewashed or like, or, or, you know what I'm saying? It, it, so for me, what I was talking about on that show, I, I made the, uh, and, and this wasn't planned. Uh, it, was a, it was a moment where uh, I believe the question was, how are you? <laughs> 20 minutes later, I had finished answering that question uh, because I decided to not just, the pleasantries are, are cute. And, and that's typically, you know, I can do that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a reporter, I'm a journalist, I'm a TV host. I can, I can say what I need to say without ruffling any feathers. And in that very moment, I intended to ruffle feathers because I said, at that point, I said to myself, you know, when I look to my left and I look to my right, I, I don't, I just don't see that same rage. And I, and it was just, I'm just so, so tired of accepting the fact that you're ignoring what's tearing me apart. You're ignoring what's breaking me down. And, and, and how do you not see all that's happening around the world? George Floyd is the first time you've seen this happening? No, it's not the first time. It's not a rare case. The reaction, to that case is what's rare. And, and that's basically what I was speaking of. It was, it was, it was a fact that like for so many months, for so, for so, for so many different uh, uh, topics, so many different scenarios where I would come in and I was deeply affected uh, by something I saw in the news or something that I saw online and nobody was talking about it. And I was just like, uh, and how are you not upset? How are you not seeing this? So it, it's, it's very interesting because, um, you know, on June 2nd, a lot of people, a lot of people posted that black square on, on Instagram. And uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was a marker uh, in time where it basically said, I see. So you finally saw, took you some time. Uh, 
I don't really believe that you didn't see before, but hey, cool. Now, now that everybody's posted this, this black square, that's literally a marker. So when you, when you scroll back through anybody's timeline, you're gonna see this black square. At that point, you saw, you see what I see. Do you feel what I feel? Do we share in this humanity? This is not just a black issue. We're talking about a man, a father, a son. We're, injustice is injustice. And so I, for me, I'm always, I'm, I'm the hippie. I'm, everything I say is gonna always be rooted in love. It's gonna be optimistic. Um, and so I, I, I urge everyone to, to, to continue to think that until all issues are our issues, so that's for everyone, everyone who's listening, everyone that's participating, all issues have to be our issues. This is why, if you notice, as we're talking about leading while black, I don't think there's one person that hasn't uh, had a reference or a mention of our indigenous brothers and sisters and persons. Because we are not trying to just like, take we're not trying to like take over we're, we're fighting for equality we, we want to be regarded as such and so black even going back sort of tying this into the first question black leadership is important because black leadership is is a is a benefit to everyone it's it's, it's not it's not just a benefit to to, to black people we're t we're, we're, we're we're talking about uh all people and, and, and that's the thing is that we're fighting for equality. So when I look to my left and I look to my right, currently, um, I see a lot more. I see a lot new, I see a lot, I see a lot of new faces. Welcome, thank you. Um, but uh, as I said also earlier, my trauma is not a trend. So we got to keep that same energy and, 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 and it's cool. You got to go to the cottage. You got to uh, you enjoy your summer. That's awesome, but please come back because we got a lot more to talk about. Wow, I, uh, I'm, I'm already starting to get uh, a headache from all the head nodding, just <laughs> nonstop. Thank, thank you for that, Tyrone. That's, yeah, thank you, so much truth in that. So thank you so much for that. Um, whew, is, is there anybody that wants to jump in on that before I move to the next? Yeah, you can't, you can't follow it up. Okay, next question. Okay, Debbie, you're one of the driving forces behind Parkdale's Queen Victoria Public Schools Black Student Success Committee. Can you tell us more about the committee and what led to its creation? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so that everybody has a little bit of context, Queen Victoria is an elementary school. It's uh, part of the TDSB, the Toronto District School Board, uh, and it's situated in the southwest corner of Toronto, so in Parkdale. It's a school that goes from junior kindergarten through grade eight, uh, and we're a highly diverse school, very um, diverse cultural mix of students and, uh, and teachers and staff as well, with about 10% of the student population identifying as Black. Uh, so this is a, a school that my daughter has been attending for the last five years. Uh, and I had a role uh, as student council here, uh, parent council chair that I stepped down from uh, for this school year, the 2019-2020 school year. Um, but something unusual happened at the start of this year when I was no longer in the council position. Uh, I had a couple of black parents approach me about wanting to get engaged and wanting to do some work around supporting the black students specifically. Um, and I think it's of consideration that this, this didn't necessarily happen when I was in the chair role. So when I was in the chair role of, you know, that very kind of established way that parents are meant to go through the system and be engaged, I didn't have, I didn't naturally have a lot of uh, Black families coming and saying, you know, just because you're in your role, I want to be here. Um, but that happened later on. And, you know, of course, I was willing to help regardless of what position I was in at the time. And we had a very fortunate situation in that we had a Black vice principal at the school who was very encouraging of parent engagement. Uh, and she was able to connect us with a number of staff, both Black and otherwise, who were also interested in really supporting Black student achievement. So we really had this perfect trifecta uh, that I recognize doesn't happen everywhere 
um, but it set us up to really start this work. And what we wanted to do as parents was see how we could work within the school community and beyond the school community to really support better outcomes for students' um, academic achievement and well-being. Uh, and that really stemmed from, you know, knowing the lived experiences that many of us um, saw growing up in the TDSB and we're now seeing our students uh, live through the same experiences. Uh, and then also knowing outcome and data wise, what the research, what the data is saying about the outcome of black students in comparison to other cultural groups and specifically compared to white students. Um, so that's where our work was really motivated from. Um, at the outset of the school year in October, when we started, we really thought that we were going to start with, you know, adding programs, adding enrichment. That's often, I think, where we start when we're looking um, at supporting Black students and Black youth or children. Uh, and what it turned into by the end of the year was really um, more work in advocacy uh, and in policy change. And that all came about um, because of the incident of anti-Black racism um, that was very publicized that came to our attention in April uh, while we were away for COVID. So, I mean, I don't want to take up all the time explaining that story, but that's um, what instigated the group and that's where the work has led us um, through the school year. Thank you for that. Um, Shamarke, uh, you know, so as we, we've already sort of been hearing in this conversation, you know, all these other panelists um, have encountered many barriers in their journey. And um, certainly, you know all about that. You're the first person elected to Victoria City Council in 153 years, as you mentioned earlier. Your election, yeah, we do need to take a moment to celebrate that. <laughs> um, your election is historic, but also, I imagine, somewhat somewhat bittersweet. Um, it really shouldn't have taken that long, you know, 153 years. And so I guess my question to you is, what are, what are some of the obstacles that you've encountered as a Black politician in Victoria who is fighting on a daily basis to ensure that Black people have a greater say in the policies that govern our lives? I think, thank you for that question. Um, and I think it's really important, as everybody already have mentioned, that the underrepresentation in, in, in politics and way too many professional fields really impact how we see ourselves in the spaces that we exist and move through. And sometimes that creates uncertainty and fear, you know, which have sadly worked toward eroding any hope and in some ways have affected the ways uh, our communities are led or the ways even our community have been designed. Uh, and as a, as a result of that, I believe more than ever, that is really important that someone who is in this space uh, I'm, I'm not only uh, black, but I'm also a renter. You know, I'm younger than 40 years. I, so I'm more than one thing. So when I am making policy, then I'm, I'm reflecting all, all those lived experience. I, I think one of the biggest challenge that in my work and, and in all the conversation I have is that if, and I'll share a bit of a story, then I will, I'll tell how that reflects in policy. If, if, if I'm in an apartment, then, you know, the elevator opens, there's old woman, then when I enter, maybe she will hold her bag because she's so this tall, six feet four black uh, person. And, and I would share that story with, uh, with friends and colleagues and when they say that, oh, you know, I, I wouldn't do that. And, and that is not something I would do that, you know. But I, I think and the, the culture we are in really focus on the individual rather than hearing what created that individual in the elevator to have that fear. Why did that individual hold their back when they see someone another human being 
entering that elevator. So I think for me, when I got into government, and as Sister Selena was saying, it was not only presentation, it was really to look the culture and structure of how we do things and how when people access services to the city, what type of experience do they have when they interact with our service? Do they have positive experience or do they have negative experience? All the decisions we make, do we, uh, how does it impact people or does it have negative impact? Who benefits all the, uh, uh, the dollar figure that all the decision we make? Because of that, I think sometimes the, the lack of, of having the lived experience in all the decision-making then misses sometimes the empathy to really connecting people who really access to our services. So that's why for me, it has been quite challenging and with, with also with my colleagues to say, how do we change the structural system? And, and one other thing is that this notion of, of trade-off, we can only serve this marginalized group right now, then we will come for the other marginalized group later. And not seeing how things are interconnected in terms of if we get racialized justice and correctly, then it really serves every other marginalized group. So it, for me, it has been very difficult to one, and because this work gets lonely when you don't have a group of, of people that you can call on and bounce ideas and, and say, you know, I'm thinking about this, you know, how, how do I go about, you know, what do I need to do? So remember, I came from zero to 100 and for me to be in this space. So every, it was a roller coaster, not only figuring out how the government operates, but also how to relate to my constituents, how to have conversation with my constituents, how to remain true to myself and, 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 and interpret what I'm thinking in my head. You know, English is my third language, but also bring different type of leadership, which is grounded in consistency. What I say in camera and what I say in private should be in consistency with the integrity, it's not easy. It's not really easy because you're really trying to see the human rights lenses in the policies you make and making sure that uh, to, the, to everyone understand that where you're coming from. So to be honest, it, it, it has been uh, very hard, but, but I'm, I'm very happy because one, I'm in a progressive council, second, we are just starting this work. I'm, I'm, I mean, like, we just trying to understand even what racialized justice means. We, we don't even have anti-racism uh, programs built in our city, but we have achieved a lot. Uh, last week, we brought a motion and, and uh, putting an end to discriminatory uh, carding and street check at the city. It passed unanimously. Uh, I brought with the mayor, the recognizing city of Victoria, the UN decade people of African descent, which is looking at our hiring practices, having internship for people of African descent and origin, having a grant uh, for business led uh, black artists and institutions that help black people. So uh, the small things happening at a local level, but also I've been pushing for equity framework, which hasn't begun yet, but we are on early stage which will help folks who, are, uh, who have hidden or visible disabilities, trans folks, everyone, so that we will see people are whole, rather than saying, oh, we help this marginalized group right now, then come for the other group. So to answer, I, 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 because I wanted to share that context, you to understand what I'm dealing with and how much I'm learning and trying to be myself. So it, it wasn't easy, but I, I, I love it because it's not about me. Uh, so one thing I should really work more 
is how do I translate the conversation I'm having with folks on the ground to a policy? And that's still where I'm struggling. And I, I think it will take time. But one thing I'm excited is I've been mentoring youth. So I, I wasn't just in there. I, 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 I came to Toronto even speaking uh, uh, youth in, in the city hall. I, I was for other things, but I wanted to share with them my experience in Vancouver, I, in Victoria, I keep giving my time. And I wonder for us uh, in, in this type of leadership, we are asking more because our communities expect us more and, and they sometimes don't understand our realities and the spaces that we work on. Thank you so much for that, Shamarke. Um, all of you are incredible listeners and I saw you all nodding, but Selena, you seem particularly engaged. There was this, this elected official sort of connection that was happening. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose my next question to you because I, I just saw you noting, uh, nodding when it came to constituents and integrity and being yourself and the work being lonely. Um, so Selena, my question for you is, you know, like Shamarke, um, you have also been able to secure a seat at the policy making table. For you, it was in 2015 when you were elected as a member of parliament for the riding of Whitby, Ontario. As an MP, you were vocal about your experiences of racism, microaggressions, body shaming. You were vocal about a number of issues. Um, and I'm wondering, do you think things have changed from then to now? Do you, do you think that we're in a very different moment from the 2015 context to now? What are some of the, the similarities and what are some of the differences that you see as someone who has bravely and boldly spoken out against uh, systemic racism in our institutions? So thank you. First, I'm nodding so much and my cheeks hurt and I saw Suzanne like rubbing her cheeks too. My cheeks are hurting because I'm hype listening to this conversation. And Shamarke, like he's actually saying a lot of my story in his experience as someone on the West Coast who is facing the same challenges and wants to be outspoken but has to represent a group of people that may or may not look like him, may or may not align politically with him. I feel the exact same way. Um, being the, the first black person elected in Whitby um, federally <laughs> or, or any government um, first in this, in this region, in Durham region um, federally is, is, is a challenge. But I think when you're outspoken and you push within and without your in, your political system um, it becomes even more uh, even more challenging so to your to your question I think um, you know Suzanne earlier was talking about how within the culinary or the hospitality industry where you know black people are underpaid they're overlooked, my experiences, I didn't tell my experiences in Parliament just because I wanted people to feel sorry for me. Um, that, was, that was not the case. Like Shamarke, like you tell those stories because you don't want people to be surprised. I didn't want the next person who I know was gonna come after me. I never wanted to be a politician. I never dreamt about it and never looked at it. I was not interested until I became a member in 2014. That was the only time I became a card carrying member of the Liberal Party because I had always voted Liberal. I was never interested in politics. So it wasn't something that I was like, oh my God, I really wanna do this. I can't wait to sit in the chair. It was something that I thought, you know what, I'm gonna bring my experience and Shamarke, I hope people are listening to this man speak because honestly, you bring that experience and with that experience, you bring empathy. And when we lose empathy from our democratic institutions, we are lost, we are done. And I think that that empathy, that experience that we bring as black people in particular because of what we lived through and big up to black women who have to deal with not just racism, but sexism, misogynoir, we have to deal with some real ish on a regular basis. And so, so that stuff that we have to deal with, you know what it creates for us? It creates a lot of empathy. So people see me and they're like, oh, she's loud. And you know, she's, she's, she's kind of a disruptor. She kind of just do what she wants. She say what she wants. But when it comes to fighting for people, when it comes to doing right by my constituents, by my folks, 
you better believe I'm going to go 10 rounds for y'all because that empathy that I bring with me in these 40 something years that I've been here has created a person that is willing to ride or die, right? So the stories that I told as someone who is a parliamentary secretary to a G7 leader, who when they see me anywhere domestically or internationally look past me and say, where's the parliamentary secretary? Where's the head of delegation? Where is the person who's supposed to be heading this meeting? And they, even when they say, oh, it's her, this one right here, they still look through me to find the other person that can't possibly be me. That kind of stuff don't sit with me, right? And when I see it happening, just like Shmari, when I saw it happening to other young women on the Hill, and you start to like mentor and every Sunday night, we'd sit and have these conversations and we'd be on the phone crying. And I'd be saying, I'm quitting tomorrow, y'all. And they'd be like, no, Selena, don't quit because I'm quitting. And we'd be like helping each other stay connected. Th that, these stories that I told, whether it's around mental health, whether it was around microaggressions, whether it was around racism, was so that the next person that comes through those doors on Parliament Hill were not surprised by the fact that there is structural violence exists in that place, that racism exists in that place. And that's not an indictment on the whole institution. That's an opportunity. That was an opportunity, which I think was missed. But nonetheless, it is an opportunity still to do better. And so do I think things have changed between 2015 and now? I was trying to remember the question that you asked because I got hype on myself trying to like answer it. Um, do I think that things have changed between 2015 and now? I think there's, like my fan um, Tyrone said, there's a lot of people who are woke last Tuesday or the Tuesday, June 2nd, where you scroll through and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, that person is woke today. But what happens next week? What happens next year? What happens at, at some point where all this wokeness, because I've done been awake. I've been awake all my life. I've seen this. I didn't need George Floyd to show me what happens when a public lynching of black people looks like. We see it every day in our education system when they're suspending our children or they're putting them into programs that won't get them a job or they're putting them into the welfare system. They've been George Floyding our kids for years. We didn't need somebody to see that on TV to know what's happening to us. And so I've, we've been woke. The fact that there are other people that are all of a sudden quote unquote woke or quote unquote realizing what is happening, that's great. How long is that gonna last? Because I think I'm the opposite of Tyrone. I think where he's like Mr. Love and Mr. Glass half, half full, I'm like, let, let me tell you something about that half empty glass you'd be holding. <laughs> but I don't, I don't wanna be pessimistic. I wanna be like, I, I, I wanna be realistic and, and really challenge people to say, look, great. You put a blackout on Tuesday. Did you have the same reaction on Wednesday? Did you use this experience, like Shemarque said, to empathize with me so that when you're writing the history books a hundred years from now, you could actually write it without erasing me from your consciousness? So that my, my, my grandchildren, I, I was at the 1992 um, protests in Toronto. I took my children last month. To, I don't want to be the woke grandma taking my kids to my grandkids to a protest at some point. That empathy is so necessary. And I'm wondering if that empathy exists still. And we see it in, in jurisdictions. We, I'm not saying that it's gone, but will it be sustained? And to answer that, I, I, I want to say yes. I want to say that there was a difference between 2015, because once we're talking about things, once we're creating awareness, once we're challenging, that is going to create some effect. The thing that I want to make sure that we're doing is creating that effect and that impact in all spaces. So like I said earlier, you don't need a title to disrupt. You just need the capacity to lead within your your space and so whatever that that space is i'm challenging people if if they are if they want to see this difference in 2020 and they want it to be sustained wherever you are whoever you are challenge that space 
be the leader in that space because in our education system, our kids are feeling it. In our healthcare system, we're not getting the care that we need and our outcomes are, are bad. Our justice system, we have an overrepresentation of black and indigenous people in our every system. So let's let's just let's just look at where we can make those changes. And hopefully we're not asking these questions. Hopefully we're we're seeing some sustainable change. So that when I look at my Harvard Business Review magazine and look at the top 100 CEOs. I could see something that looks a little bit more like me and a less homogenous. I wanna see us, us there. The, the, the most educated population in North America right now is the black woman. And we won't receive pay equity until 2100. What's that gotta say? Tell me when that gets corrected. Let me know, let me know when I could get pay equity. Let me know when, when I, with my two MBAs and my getting my PhD, tell me when I could get pay equity. When that kind of real stuff happens, then I'd say, yes, change has had impact. But until, until you stop suspending our kids, until we have health our outcomes that are equal, until I get pay equity, until all of these things happen, we have to keep on fighting. And the more of us that jump on the train, the better. Yes, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I need a drink, y'all. <laughs> ah! yeah. Yo, that was, oh my gosh. Wow. I, I'm, I'm just going to hop in. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. go for it. Please. Um, I, I, whew, that was amazing. And every time she speaks, I get, I get hyped. Just, uh, just to reiterate that. But I, as much as I'm an optimist, uh, as much as I'm an optimist, I, what, I, what I'm looking for, uh, because I do believe that if people do get tired, they go to the cottage and then they forget what they were working on before they left. And people uh, you know, are trying to save their summer more than they're trying to save my life. So what I'm looking for uh, is that are those long-term commitments. With this same energy that you have right now, let's make some commitments right now so that so that uh, so that your 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 efforts aren't just symbolic gestures. See, the cat agrees with me. Uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Selena, that was wonderful. But yes, as, as much as I'm optimistic, I, I'm looking for some real some real long term commitments because imagine this. I'll share this as uh, uh, as a black man, but. As a man, I wanted my dream job was to be on television. And imagine getting on television. You get the dream job. You're like, oh my goodness, I'm so happy. I'm so grateful. Thank you, Lord. And then you're met, your dream job still has the same uh, uh, traces of some of your other nightmares. Right. That, 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 that's just the reality of it. Uh, and so yes. therefore, I want to make sure that my contributions, the reason why I'm unmuted is so that the next young person of color uh, or, or the next black man, the next black woman that comes into this system and, 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 and gets his or her dream job, that they don't have to deal with a lot of the BS that I had, that I've had to deal with. Um, and so, yes, we're just doing our part in all of our spaces. So thank you, Selena, for getting me hype. I want some red wine, too. <laughs> um, my next question is for you, Suzanne. Um, so, I mean, this one, this is a tough one. So, you know, many of us were devastated at the news of the closing of your restaurant, True True Diner. Um, you know, earlier, earlier you said, you know, our food tells, tells our story. And it's so clear from the way that you think, the way that you practice your art, that True True Diner was so much more than a restaurant. And, uh, you know, on an Instagram post, you wrote, we didn't want to close our doors. The decision was made for us by partners who intentionally kept us in the dark. And so can you tell us more about what happened and your thoughts about what role Black entrepreneurship can play in Black liberation? I, you know, I saw that question and like, you know, I have to like express to everyone that I'm operating from almost past E, 
Like I'm, I'm, I've been in the state of trying to refuel myself because of how heavy and weight the last couple of weeks have been for me. You know, I want to clarify, you know, a few things that I think maybe people assumed about our closure and the sense that when we made the statement, we were, we were in very, um, very specific air waters of where we had legal, we had legal on both sides. Um, and my lawyer was giving me a lot of, of, of information and understanding that be careful with defamation, be careful with liability, make sure that you are just telling your truth. And for me, everything that we experienced was my truth and everything that I experienced in that, in that working relationship. So I just want to clarify exactly what happened. We were told we closed our doors in March. A month after we closed our doors, we could see that COVID was really truly affecting the restaurant industry. One of the, one of the top grossing industries in this country and many countries around the world that have, have seen restaurants open and close due to this and not having any real idea of what, what is it gonna look like on the other side for restaurants? What reality, what real support? The government started to um, really push forward with um, uh, rent relief, um, wage subsidy relief, as well as small business support. We had a conversation a few times with our partners where we expressed the importance of let's get active, let's, let's actually start applying I have been on many calls and conversations because I, I am engaged in that way and finding out what is gonna look like when we go, when we step into post COVID, when we step into phase three, even phase two, knowing phase two is coming in June, we started to prepare for pivots that we can change within our model, our business model, which is fundamental. And I think everyone's had to do that. So with some of that change came a lot of exploration, a lot of, of, of thinking outside of the box. What would we look like if we were a bakery? What would we look, ba- look like if we were a community kitchen? Because I had already been doing so much outreach cooking with a lot of organizations in the city. What would we look like if we were a general store? And what would we look like if we were offering takeout? Because we chose not to do that from the beginning for the safety of ourselves and our staff. We had a conversation in early June with our partners and they expressed to us that they were no longer interested in continuing to fund. We had a partnership where we were operating partners and our partners were the financial backers. So Selena, when you talk about equity, I had equity. I had 28% equity in this business. That didn't make me a majority stakeholder and that didn't allow my voice to actually even make a difference and this shit's still happening. Shortly thereafter, we took ourselves out and we, we really thought about like, could we continue to operate this business by finding our own funding? And which I did, I secured funding. I was able to receive a seed amount that I could then use to be able to get additional monies. Shortly thereafter that we presented a letter of intent that had been reviewed by our lawyer. We presented that to our partners. Our partners were silenced for two weeks. Two weeks they were silent. After the two weeks, after we probe them, poke them, text him, finally he gets back. I'll get back to you next week. Next week came and the email came out. Unfortunately, due to this at this time, we feel that post COVID is very, very uh, um, hasty in thinking that the restaurant industry has a real viable possibility. And at this time, we as a, as a company and we as real estate owner, property owners, do not feel a restaurant is the right space within this space to continue to operate. If you can please present a, an additional business plan with your idea of a new business that you could see running within this space, we would gladly review as if we were strangers off the street, as if I hadn't been working my ass off with the 14 incredible staff members, my partner, all the work that we put into that, all of the energy, all of the belief, all of the photos on the wall that had that were representing the history of what diners meant for communities. Being on King Street East as one of the first and probably now the last black run business, how what do you want me to give you? A business plan for a nail tech? That's not what I do. I'm a chef. So we basically, on top of that, 
he closed the door. He said we had a week to get, get our things out of the building, to return the keys, and to walk away. I made that statement on the last day that I was in that space, and it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, and I couldn't stop crying. I, did, I was shaking, not because of fear, but it was fear on top of anger, on top of someone that just didn't even give me the opportunity, that used their own privilege to be able to just put their, their, literally his, his foot on my throat to try to choke me out, quiet me. And I was like, fuck that, sorry. Tell you know story. this, huh? Just tell your story, that's okay. That's you know, okay. it's- um, Don't apologize. True True is not just, a, this is not just about one restaurant closing. This is about an opportunity to be able to continue to operate an idea, a dream that wasn't just rooted in me. It was rooted in every single person that ever came into that space, every single person that worked in that space that believed in what we were attempting to try to do. One of our last events that we were able to, to have before COVID hit was a, a chef series called For the Love Of, where our focus was about Black celebrating Black chefs and their stories. Because I know, like the many other chefs, Adrian Forte, Chef Bashir Mounier, Joshna Maharaj, the many chefs that are in this, in this city, Latoya Flagan, the many chefs that live in this city, operate in the city that have been silenced or been asked to just cook what you know. What we know is everything that you think we don't know. And what we are here to do now, and what I'm here to do now is just to tell my truth, to tell my story, to tell what has happened, and to find a way to help small businesses, to find a way to help Black and Indigenous business so that this doesn't keep happening, that we don't get silenced by landowners, by landlords that feel that they're guilty, their guilt, their white privilege, their white supremacy does not is not seen. Because I... And, and everyone else sees it. And my partner walks, and I still to this day have yet to talk to him. His choice to ignore me is his choice in his fear of me. His misogyny, his behavior, his reaction, his non-there response. So this is not about him. This is about finding power in all of the voices that will be in front of me, behind me, beside me looking to my left and looking to my right, knowing that I'm not alone. And knowing that as a business, it's not about the shame of closing a business and that you didn't work hard enough because I know that anyone that opens up a business, you know how hard and how much work you put into it. And I know that anyone that goes through anything like this, don't feel that you're alone. Don't feel the shame. Stand up and speak your truth. Share your story because these stories are which help others to be able to not feel like they continue to be pushed down, pushed aside. And so I am, with all due respect and pleasure, I'm here to say that I will continue to rise. We will continue to rise. We will continue to lead in kitchens. We will continue to tell our stories. We will continue to make sure that the message of the truth will absolute, absolutely be heard. And you will not, you will not take my spirit because I have found humility in all of this of letting you go and letting something in that's even more magical, that's more powerful. And that is, you know, the truth of what happened with True True Diner. I want to cry. Oh my God, that was just, somebody put goosebumps in the, in the, what's it thing called? A chat. Girl, you are like, everything and then some i i don't have words yeah thank you thank you suzanne for being just so um honest and vulnerable and, and speaking your truth um for those of you on this uh you know on this event that don't know 
Suzanne is one of the most respected chefs in Canada. And so you've been told now, folks, there's no excuse. If you don't know, now you know. Um, visit SuzanneBarFood.com, all right? Okay, folks, we are almost out of time. We have, we have six minutes left, and I, I have a, a million questions left. So I'm going to try here to squeeze in two questions, which is almost impossible. I'm going to try and squeeze in two, okay? So the first question um, to all of the group, and just jump in as you see fit, being a Black leader doesn't necessarily mean that your politics are progressive or that you're, com you're committed to um, championing Black liberation. You know, as Zora Neale Hurston said, not all skin folk are my kin folk. Straight up. So I want to know, what do you do to make sure that your your moral compass, your integrity is in line with Black liberation, with Black interest? How do you make sure that you're accountable to Black communities and doing that work, that vital work? My quick answer in, in terms of uh, respecting the time is, as Selena mentioned, my mine will always be rooted in love. Mine will always be rooted in remembering what it felt like on, on along my journey. Uh, so I'll share this quickly. Someone asked me, hey, Tyron, what do you think we should be doing in our community? Because I'm, I'm doing some work in the Jane and Western Jane and Chichewa area where I grew up uh, with uh, a walk-in mental health clinic and actually with some food stuff. So I know there's some people here that I can actually connect with. But she asked me a question and she said, uh, I want you to answer. Uh, she said, what do you think? And I said, uh, and I was about to answer. She goes, no, answer it as 17-year-old T-Rex, not 37-year-old Tyrone Edwards. And I thought about it. I thought about how I would have, how I would have uh, processed <laughs> that question. And it scared me. I literally sat there in a room with eight people with tears coming down my face, a room that I had already prejudged because I was like, how do I just walk into a room with eight white people that are going to tell me what to do in, in my community? I had already prejudged them, and I so I didn't even feel comfortable right away. But that that the the the, the way I was answering that question scared me to think the risks that I would that I was willing to take at 17 because growing up in those neighborhoods, you, your your main objective is to make it out. This this weird false burden of making it out of an area that is now, that was once unattractive, that is now almost unattainable and unaffordable. There was nothing wrong with the streets that I grew up on because those developers find no problems with it now. They're trying to, anyways, I, I said I was going to respect the time, but in order for me to uh, keep Black liberation uh, at the forefront in anything that I'm doing, and whatever the platform may be, is to always remember my experiences and always keep that communication uh, open with people that are uh, that are people that are on a different walks, a different part, different uh, parts of their their journey, their journey. So people that are, are accomplished, but then people that are uh, that are new, people that are entry level, people that are lost. You got to talk to everyone. So that's that's my, my piece. Quick question: Are folks able to stay until seven forty? Can we push this ten minutes? Is that is that a possibility for people? Can we? Yes. Okay. Okay. Amazing. So next person who wants to jump in on that question of how do you make sure that you're staying online with Black Liberation? I, I, I want to go on, please. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then jump in and say, you know, for me, there's been a lot of personal development work that has come along with this role that I didn't necessarily anticipate. Um, and it's taken a lot of looking at my own experiences and you know, where I have not felt as confident using my voice and why. And I'll just give an example, you know, I'm talking about navigating the education space. Well, I'm navigating a space that I was also a product of. So, you know, I recognize that the reason that I did very well academically, the way I was, uh, the reason I was able to go on to university and the way I was able to enter the workforce and do so well is because this system taught me how to be polite, how to be quiet, how to not ruffle feathers, um, how to speak in a certain way. And those are all the things that I needed to be really conscious of as I was doing the work. And I needed to strip things away from myself as well. And uh, one of the ways that I did that was really tapping into and aligning with other leaders. So you know, we've talked about that before and why that's so important. 
Um, but I really tapped into, you know, the work that Kika has been doing with Kojo Institute. Um, I've been very inspired by a lot of our NDP Black Caucus leaders. Um, so even the women that I work with most closely, you know, I'm only one part of the Queen Victoria Success Committee, the Black Student Success Committee, there's two other parents where we are literally on the phone almost daily, you know, to Suzanne's point and Selena's point about like, girl, am I sending this email? And like, no, I'm done here. And you know, all of that, um, you know, all of that has helped me stay connected to the roots of who I am. And it has been able to inform the work that I do so that it remains on task in supporting, you know, what we want to support. Thank you so much for that, Debbie. So maybe I should jump in. For me, it was quite interesting when the Black Lives Matter happened because I have seen a lot of Black folks that I have never seen in my community. So it was an opportunity, a lot of people came out. And for me, that was amazing. I have seen champion, rugby, national Canadian champion, champions who are people of Afghan descent from all walks of life. For the last three weeks, I had the privilege to really work with the folks. The, the motion that I brought with them last Thursday. So, but, but what I understood was when we say black community, we're not monolithic. We have a different perspectives. We approach certain issues different ways. So being able to really work, listen, and, and bring people to see how could we really collectively achieve something was a bit of, uh, it, took, it took time. But it was really lost of the time. And, and for the first time, the last two weeks, I felt like I really uh, wrote something that really that came from the Black community, in particular, the UN decade people of Afghanistan, the declaration. And we didn't want it to be only symbolic, performative declaration, but have a of recommendation and those recommendations actually came from the community activists, organizations, students, and I was really happy. And and one one thing for me is I really look into other leaders that exist in the, in the country that are doing amazing work and how do I connect with them? And from from today on, uh, I mean, each one of you would receive an email from me so that we stay connected as well. So thank you for creating this space as well. Thank you, Shumaki. Yeah. I'll keep my answer brief. I'll keep it to one minute, like I'm in question period or something. And it is true that not all skin folk are kin folk. And that's, that's clear, not all of us are interested in black liberation. That's cool. But there is a critical mass of people that we need to move that train with, with or without you unapologetic, in fact, with or without you. I think one of the things that we need to be mindful of as those people that are on the train, as was mentioned earlier, I think by Debbie, is that there are different leadership styles. There are people who are disruptors, like me. There are people who, pro who are process people. There are people who are silent. There are people who are loud. We need to respect the people if they decide to get on the train. Right. If they, they're on the train and they're interested in black liberation, they're interested in doing what they can within their own context, as small as it is or as big as it is, not everybody's going to disrupt, not everybody's going to, you know, want to rattle cages. But if they're there, let's be respectful of that and move forward collectively. We can leave those others behind, but the ones that are on the train, we have to be mindful of what they can bring and what they're willing to bring. Church. 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 <laughs> did somebody say church? Oh. <laughs> um, Suzanne, did you want to jump in on this? Or you want me to go to the next question? No, go ahead to the next question. I was just ch churching. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, folks. So, uh, final question before I wrap this whole thing up. Um, so, we've spoken about the ways that uh, leading while Black can be a uniquely difficult thing to do. Um, and so, I'm wondering what gives you hope when it comes to Black leadership? 
Okay, I'm gonna go first. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is a this is an easy one for me, and I think when it comes to black leadership, and I it's gonna sound so cliche, but I have three kids that are brilliant, that are like. There are there's if you think Selena bad, these kids are like they are Selena 2.0. I love them. They're my heroes, um, especially my girls. I have my, my son too, but my girls are my heroes. Next generation, next, they they have this. I feel like they have what I missed when I was in politics. One of the things that I missed, I'm gonna keep this short. One of the things that I missed was that that connection that I'm the only one, I'm the only black female and blah, blah, blah. And I, I was not the only one. I was not the only one in tech. I was not the only one in hospitality. I was not the only one in fitness. I was not the only one, but I felt like I was the only one. And I started this mindset of being the only one. And I think one of the things that ge the next generation does is stay connected. And I wish I did that better. I wish I connected with others and said, hey, I'm having a problem. So Shamarke, call me. Like, don't sit in this loneliness by yourself because that is going to make you crazy. Stay connected. I think our young people stay connected. And they're doing things that are like, they are outside of the box thinking. They're not jaded by life. They are, they are, they are passionate. And they have that empathy. So I would say it's out of self-interest and it's probably, you know, totally out of self-interested aspects, but the young people, my children, heroes, total amazing people. Gives me hope. And thank you all. This was great. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump in. Um, I absolutely agree with everything that Selena is saying because you know, I'm, I'm raising a, a young boy and he's five now, but even think reflecting back to my team and, and they're, they were the ones that really drove so much inspiration from me because they weren't, not, weren't, weren't waiting for someone to give them an opportunity. They were taking, they were stepping into, let's create a pop-up. Let's start up something on our own. Let's start something where we create a, a collective collaborating, fi finding allyships, finding, finding kitchens that we can do pop-ups out of, that we can, we can, we can communally work together. And, and really understanding that it's, it's, it's about building that, that sense of, of confidence in seeing maybe, maybe or maybe not, it might be a chef that has inspired you, but also being inspired by music, also being inspired by culture, also being inspired by art, also being inspired by things they're reading, going back to the history of reading Audre Lorde, Nikki Giovanni, um, Richard Wright, you know, like the incredible, incredible literature and, 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 and renaissance that was so much a part of the history and understanding that there is, there was so much in that history that can absolutely help them create the future for themselves. And knowing that themselves and finding the confidence in who they are and where they're from, being immigrant kids, being born and raised in Toronto kids, being raised like myself in, Amer in, in, in Canada, but being raised in the US and finding my identity in that. You know, being of Caribbean background and finding the praise and the celebration of who we are and who we are as Black and Indigenous folks and, and what is the movement in our sexuality and in our spirit and our humility and our empathy and all the things. So there is so much that I look forward to in seeing and I just want to be a, a part. I want to be on the on the side of the road watching. I remember when I was 22 years old and I attended the, the first and only Million Women's March. And what that did for me is what set me on the path. And so I see these kids now at the Black Lives Move Matter marches and protests and starting up their own movements. I'm like, yo, OK, I get it. I get it. And I'm so excited and, and so welcome to see what the future is going to look like because I'll be a part of it because I'm raising a young black boy in it. So that's where my hope lives. I'll jump in if that's okay. And I'll say, um, you know, my hope lives with the winds. 
you know, we had about a three month journey as three moms who didn't know a ward meeting from a board meeting three months ago. And we have had policy change across the board. We have had a new principal, new superintendents put in place. Um, we have seen, we organized a walk within four days. We organized a walk and had 300 people get behind us to amplify our message and say that they were in support. Uh, and just very recently after attending and speaking at a delegation at the Board of Education, we've since learned that uh, the chair has stepped down from her position. So these are huge, huge wins for us as people who you know, didn't necessarily feel equipped or positioned in the beginning, um, but we absolutely see that it has not been in vain. We've seen what we've been able to accomplish together. We've seen the amount of people that had jumped on who have wanted to bolster us and you know, and give us shoulders to rise on. Uh, and that gives me so much hope that, you know, we're not stopping. <laughs> we're just figuring out, you know, the next path, the next fork, how we do it, who comes along. Um, but I have so much hope for what we can continue to accomplish as long as we keep going. I agree. I think that that oh, is go ahead. The, the perfect note to end on. I got, I'm getting, the, I'm getting the, the push to end this. I'm um, just out of respect for everybody's time. Um, so I'm sorry to cut it short. We could go on forever, but um, I want to thank you all for just such a great conversation. I want to thank each panelist, um, Debbie King, Tyrone Edwards, uh, Selena Caesar Chavan, um, Shamarke Dugo, Suzanne Barr. Thank you all so, so much for sharing your wisdom. Um, thank you for the incredible work that you've done, the work that you're doing and the work that you will do. Um, it's been a tremendous honor to share space with you during this strange and unusual time of COVID-19. Um, I also just wanna thank our two interpreters from the Toronto Sign Language Interpreter Service. Um, thank you so, so much for your incredible work. Um, and lastly, I just need to say that um, your donations, so to the audience, your donations help FoodShare bring together events like tonight's panel. And so if you're interested in supporting more work like this, you can donate to FoodShare by visiting www.foodshare.net. Um, lastly, thanks to the event team. Um, just incredible work. And I hope that we all get to stay in touch after this. Uh, it's been a really great panel. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you. Philip, shout out to you. Thank you. You were great. Awesome. Philip, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Philip. Thank you, Philip. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone.